be used. Um, it'll just be covered up. And so Peter's just coming into the meeting. So um, what I'm going to do is um, uh, I'm going to uh, flick around between um, a PowerPoint, some slides that I've um, prepared. Uh, I'm going to go on to the Volleyball England website so that we know where the MVL regulations and COVID addendum and that sort of thing are. Um, what I would ask is if you have any questions, you um, you uh, just just call them out at the time. Just put your uh, hand up. I'll try and make sure that I can see um, see the chat as well. Um, although uh, sometimes when I'm in um, present presentation mode on this, um, I can't actually see the uh, uh, the chat function. So uh, you'll just have to um, to shout. I suspect. To get my attention, that might be the easiest way. OK, um, if you can stay on mute unless you um, wish to have a chat or wish to say something, that would be really helpful so that we don't get any background um, noise on it. Um, so what I'm going to, what we're going to do is I'm just about to try and share the PowerPoint with you. And uh, then we will um, discuss, say what we're going to talk about and uh, we'll make a start so that we're not here for too long this evening. OK, so I'm going to try and. I'm not sure I can share my screen properly. And from that, hopefully you can now see the uh, presentation uh, screen. Is that correct? Yes, that's it. Is. Great, super. OK, so um, the what I was going to do to today is um, we'll go through this in in the sort of style that we would do if we were having a, a conference. Um, we decided this year not to have a conference for a number of reasons. One was availability of venues. Um, and another was the fact that uh, uh, we spent so long trying to organise the National Volleyball League season that we really didn't, uh, we almost ran out of time in order to try and get a face to face conference together. So I decided to split it into uh, two sections, which one of which was last week when we had a chat about the rules and, and uh, a few of you were also on that call. Uh, and we talked about a bit of the rules and we had a look at um, at that point. We actually had a look at the COVID addendum as well to the National Volleyball League regulations. Um, but we'll cover it again today because it's worth doing so. And if you've got any any comments about it, then but then please shout. Um, and um, then this meeting, which I just wanted to to cover the National Volleyball League, uh, some of the other things that we talk that we we do about um, uh, talk about it at conference and also to introduce a few uh, members uh, of the officials group if you if you don't know them already and some of you are, are new so uh, it's worthwhile telling you who's who and who who looks after uh, referees in this country um, and then um, we're going to uh, have a look at um, uh, the MVL regulations uh, the COVID addendum uh, the officials academy if we uh, need to uh, well well i will do talk about that because there's a, there's a section in there that i want to um uh, to show you uh, a bit about grade four courses and how they might change in the future um there are um there are some upgrades to do particularly from the from the beach season that we have just finished um and uh, obviously I can accept questions around upgrades and things. And then at the end, obviously, if there's any questions that we haven't covered um, up to that point, then you're more than welcome to um, shout it out at that point. OK, so that's what I wanted to do. So first and foremost, um, uh, I'm just make sure that I can. Right. So I just want to say about Volleyball England. So those of you that don't know about don't know Volleyball England and don't know the people that are involved, in the professional staff uh, in the office, the hub, as there is now, uh, it's, it's known. So Volleyball England is based in Loughborough, Loughborough University. Um, they are um, pretty much next door to Sport England. 
um, and they work in the same building as wheelchair um, rugby I think and basketball and a few other sports so they're they're relatively well connected in terms of uh, keeping abreast of, of, of what's uh, impacting various sports um, so the um, uh, the sport is is the Pot of England is managed by Sue Storey, who's our CEO, um, and she has working for a number of people. And here, this is not uh, all of the people that work in the office because there are some work streams here that um, that don't touch refereeing. Um, but the way they're structured is that Sam Jamieson is the deputy CEO, for want of a better title. Um, and she oversees the the day to day management of the uh, staffing and our key um, link in the uh, hierarchy is through Gillian Harrison, who is the strategic manager for volleyball for life. Um, this is the stream, uh, the work stream within Volleyball England that we um, uh, sit within. Uh, and you'll hear more about that over the next few weeks as uh, they get themselves organised. So previously we used to call ourselves core market subgroups and things like that uh, within Volleyball England. Um, our referees came into the core market subgroup, but now we're in a, within a strategic uh, stream of Volleyball for Life. And other personnel at Volleyball England that you might need to come across are um, Rob Payne, who is the competitions manager. So he took over from Jonathan Moore um, as Jonathan went uh, out to Tokyo to look after the uh, para volley uh, uh, Olympic uh, Paralympic uh, program. Um, and Jonathan has moved on to uh, Birmingham uh, 22 to the Commonwealth Games Organising Committee, where he has full responsibility for beach volleyball delivery. So Jonathan's doing re really well in his uh, in his career in terms of sport management, and that left a big gap within Volleyball England, um, which Rob Payne has stepped into. Um, the next person that you many of you will know is Stuart Thorpe, who has um, supported us um, over the last year as we went through Let's Talk Rules with our online um, sessions with Let's Talk Rules. Um, and Stuart looks after all of the communications um, and uh, the website and all of those sorts of things um, as best he can. Uh, as many of you know, the website is is getting a bit old now, um, so we, we would like to um, see a brand new one, but um, uh, it, t times are tough. So, uh, so Rob Stewart is working as best he can with what he's got, and he has somebody working for him called Charlotte Lingham, and Charlotte Lingham is a, is a composite assistant. And you may have noticed that Charlotte was the one that sent out their recent um, uh, referee newsletter. Um, to us now, Charlotte's only just joined, so um, she's still learning what goes on and what needs to be done. So if things aren't quite as slick in that communication, um, it, it's not Charlotte's fault. It's uh, it's the fault of us, uh, of, of, of me and Stuart for uh, uh, not get, giving her the, the full guidance that perhaps she may have required. And then uh, on a day to day basis, um, referees are looked after by Vicky Carr who is the core market um, support for, for refereeing. So if you have any queries about refereeing with Volleyball England, then you can contact them through refereeing at volleyballengland.org. Um, similarly, in the same way as if you have a question about competitions or feedback from a match that you need to get to Rob Payne, you would send it to competitions at volleyballengland.org. Um, as I say, refereeing uh, matters go to refereeing at volleyballengland.org. Um, and there are various other um, uh, email addresses like info at volleyballengland.org and, and things like that that deal with um, uh, ways to communicate with the with the hub team. So there, that's the, the 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 people that we we uh, link into at Volleyball England. Um, so the officials working group, um, which is uh, responsible for the carpet, and it's quite a quite a large group. And the reason it's a large group is because um, I need um, plenty of um, people willing to do small amounts. You've got to remember we're all volunteers, and um, a time is uh, really uh, tight for most of us. So um, anyone that can that can support. Um, uh, is is welcome to, to to help out, and we have a a, a meeting every um, uh, six weeks to eight weeks or so um, to talk about developments within refereeing and how we're going to cover things such as courses, uh, developments, observations, assessments, uh, appointments, 
um, and various other um, uh, items. So, my name, so I'm Nick Heckford. I, I, I lead the officials working group um, and I take the responsibility for uh, the technical aspects of the game as an international referee. And I also look after uh, finance. Now, this says um, I've just noticed that I've left Steve Evans on here. Um, Steve Evans was the previous lead, um, and Steve is having a well-earned retirement down in Devon now. So, um, uh, so you, you won't uh, you won't hear from Steve. Um, but Steve um, was responsible for setting up the VOA, the Officials Academy, um, and he's passed that responsibility on to on to me. Um, Martin Shakespeare. Um, works very hard uh, as uh, he is our competitions commission or competitions working group liaison he looks after who's the ref um, and uh, does mvl appointments um, and uh, sets all of the fixtures up um, he's the guy that puts everything into who's the ref that can make sure that all the clubs know when the fixtures are and who the referees are going to be so if you do accept an appointment which is not in who's the ref or in addition to the ones you've got in Who's the Ref, just drop Martin a note to say, I'm going to this match, and then he will put you officially onto the match in Who's the Ref. Um, and uh, then we have a full view of your activity and what's going on. Uh, Seb Bidlarch, uh, international referee, um, he looks after grade four courses and observations. Uh, Deborah Smart looks after the beach and the Birmingham 22 uh, the Commonwealth Games Readiness um, Programme. And she's supported in that by Greg Thompson, who is an international beach referee, and he looks after the technical aspects as he's an extremely experienced um, referee in the uh, for the FIVB. Um, then we have uh, Glyn Archibald um, looks after sitting or World Power Volley. Uh, he is president of the World Power Volley Referee Commission. So um, Glyn's um, workload globally is um, quite excessive. Um, so he, he takes a, a little bit of a back seat, but he's always good to uh, get his view on things. Um, and then we have Dee Walkup and um, Peter Parsons, who both are international para volley referees, and they look after the, the, um, the, the sitting and the sitting Grand Prix um, along with Glyn in, the, in this country. And Peter also helps me with VEOA. Um, and then we have Richard Burbage, who um, helps Martin with who's the ref and looks after MVL appointments for Division 3, Division 2 in the south of the country. Um, and then we have Katerina Sepinova um, and Dominic Bigailo, who are both international referees, and Joe Gore, who I should have added to this. I apologise, Joe, um, to this. They're all international referees and um, they're on for because they pick up on the technical side of the game and how it's developing. And then Di Hollows up in the north, she does MVL appointments um, in the north of the country. So that's who the officials working group are and um, what, what they, what they uh, do. Um, and then in terms of our international representation um, to know what's going on in global volleyball, um, we have the international referees, which are myself, Seb Larch, Dominic Bagailo, Katarina Stepanova and Joe Gore. And Stuart Dunn is also an FIVB supervisor, um, and he's the, he may still be the chair of NEVSA, uh, which is the North East Volleyball Zonal Association. So that covers Scandinavia, of which England is part, uh, in terms of the zones of, uh, of Europe. Um, and we keep uh, each other uh, up to date with how the rules are being interpreted and developments in the game internationally so that we can feed them back to you as referees to keep you up to speed with how the game is developing um, uh, overseas. On the sitting, um, Dee Walker and Peter Parsons um, uh, in, are active international referees for para volley. And as I said, Glyn looks after the referee commission for world para volley. And then on the beach, we have Greg Thompson um, and uh, also uh, many of you will know Jeff Brio, um, who is an FIVB supervisor. He's an FIVB referee coach and referee instructor. Um, and what Jeff doesn't know about the beach is probably not worth knowing. So um, he is a very useful person to have and uh, a great person to, to, to learn from. And then, as I mentioned, uh, Jonathan Moore, who is uh, from seconded at the moment from Volleyball England to the 
Commonwealth Games Organising Committee to look after beach volleyball. So that's how we are represented outside of Volleyball England. And there are other um, uh, supervisors um, that are within the, the game within England um, that I haven't uh, mentioned here. So someone like, for example, Lewis Bellow um, from Richmond Volleyball Club. He is a, a CV Champions League supervisor. Um, uh, and, uh, there are uh, one or two others that are that currently living in the UK and other international referees that are currently living in the UK as well. So um, uh, you may come across some of those as uh, as you go through the, the year. Um, just a quick note on observers. So all of our grade one national referees who I'll talk about later, and there's a reason why I'm not going to talk about them now. Um, plus Brian Stalker and Richard Inslee, who helped me out with observations. Um, and then our referee tutors are all of the observers, um, plus um, Richard, Lenny, Keith, Phil, Dave, Rita uh, and Herman, who will run courses as and when required and do a fantastic job at looking after uh, certain regions of the country in terms of grade four courses. And then when you're at a match, all senior referees um, can always feed back on a junior colleague and support them and give them pointers for their development. And you are also able to feed, the, feed that information back to me um, if you think that a, a referee that you've been with um, is, is ready for the next step or should be getting better games or you have um, a point that you want to make to me, then you're more than welcome to do so. So if you're the senior referee at a match, then, uh, then part of your job as part of doing the match would also hopefully be able to um, give some 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 feedback to some of your colleagues that um, that may be of a, a lower grade than you, um, and how they can develop. And I'm sure that you do that all the time anyway, uh, in in uh, in the as we go through the year. So that just about covers all of those. So what? The, the main bulk of the uh, evening that I wanted to do was just to make sure that we were up to speed on the National Volleyball League regulations. And um, uh, to um, ensure that um, uh, we understand the ones that affect um, referees and how we interpret dealing with those regulations. Um, so one of the first things to, to say about them is, well, where on earth do you find them? So hopefully you know where to find them. But if you don't, then if you go on to the Volleyball England website, www.volleyballengland.org, um, you get a landing page, which at the moment looks something like this. Um, and in the top right hand corner, there's a red menu uh, button. So you click on the menu button and you will get up the, ve the, the, the menu and the menu will have part of it saying competitions. So under get into volleyball, there's competitions. And at the top of the competitions list is the National Volleyball League. So you just need to click on the National Volleyball League and then you get taken to the old part of the website. Um, and at the uh, top left, um, you can see that um, you get the uh, rules and information and the league table uh, where just underneath all of the league tables. So you just need to click onto rules and information. And when you um, uh, Sarah in, and then when you uh, have done so, um, then you can get into uh, a page which um, has all of the regulations for um, uh, the season um, in it. And it's always good to either uh, download the uh, a copy of the regulations. Uh, some some of you have uh, the smartphones that are able to. Uh, hold this document um, on the, and it's quite a it doesn't take up a lot of space um, and uh, you can use uh, you can then flick to it um, when you're at a venue if you need to particularly if you get a query or you can actually just go onto the website and find it as you uh, as, as you're asked but there are other elements of the website that you need to access or you may need to access at a match so um, it's always good to know where to get to the information um, when you're there so what um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to just come out of the PowerPoint and see if I can go on to the Volleyball England uh, website. Uh, so, uh, one, that one. So here we are. This is the page um, as it uh, the, the landing page for the National Volleyball League. And as you can see, they've tried to 
it seems to be a, a little bit more fancy um, sort of graphics have been put on it, but we're interested in the um, the rules and information. So when you go into the um, rules of in, uh, as information, let's hope this is going to work now. Yes, so you come into um, the, the the various documents within within here. Now the important ones for you are the regulations, second one down, the COVID addendum. And uh, there is a document here called the regulation amendments. And what that is, is actually shows you the changes that were made between the last set of regulations and the current set. Now, this is a document which is um, showing the tracking of the changes which have been made. So it's quite a difficult document to read, but it does show you how uh, the regulations have changed and what aspects of them, where wording has changed or whether they've um, deleted some elements of it. Um, then you have the MVL and CUT trigrams, which is a document which you will need to complete to help your scorers complete your score sheets. Um, if you, you need to know what the trigrams are for the teams that are competing in the match that you have, otherwise, so that those are the ones that go onto the score sheet so that we don't have any missing misunderstanding as to which team has, has actually uh, taken part in the match. Um, so th they are there if you ever need to, to, to use them because Teams will come along and um, you'll ask them for their trigram and they'll either know it or they will make it up on the spot. Um, and when you have a, a, a team that may have more than one team, one side within within the club, um, then it's not always going to be, for example, if you had uh, London Polonia, LOP, um, uh, if they had a second team, then they may actually be called LP1 and LP2 or some other combination of uh, to get their trigram. So it's always worthwhile just checking that you have the right trigram. I'll uh, show you what I mean. So here are uh, this document just lists all of the trigrams. So here's one Bristol Volleyball Club have two and they are BR1 and BR2. So just to uh, to know that it's not always um, the uh, the obvious uh, trigram for the team. So if you took here, for example, City of Bristol ladies are CBR, when you might think that they might be BRS or BRI or something. But that's obviously because um, you can't call them BRI because that looks too close to BR1. So therefore, um, they will they are known as CBR to make sure that when they're on the score sheet, they are completely distinguishable from Bristol Volleyball Club 1. So this is all the trigrams and uh, for all the teams that are in the cup and in the National League. So that's a good thing, uh, a good document to to know where you're going to find it. And here it is here in the website. Um, MVL accepted balls. So if you ever uh, get presented with a with a ball that you don't recognize, so um, maybe somebody gives you a, uh, I don't know, Tachikara or one of those old uh, old ones that's one for the old uh, older referees amongst us that can remember them um you can uh, you can look on the uh, accepted balls and basically any ball which is um homologated by the FIVB is allowed to be used um so um i'm i'm very surprised to see these decathlon balls in here but um Let's hope. Let's hope we don't. You don't see too many of them. I would. I would expect you to spend most of your time. You will see the MV200, MVA200, and the uh, uh, V200W, uh, which are the the V200W is the current international ball, and the MVA200 is the previous international ball. Um, now they are yellow and blue. Um, there are some green and yellow versions of those balls. Um, the green and yellow version is not um, uh, acceptable in the National Volleyball League. It's actually only a CV Champions League uh, ball, uh, and that's the only competition which it's used in, which is why it's not on this list. But as you can see, a team is quite within their rights to use the Molten uh, BV500 or the Gala, uh, Gala ball there, the red, white and blue ball from Gala, the BV5191S. Um, but as I say, the, the main ones you'll, you'll see are these Macaza ones here. And the, the 300 is just a cheaper version of the 200, and several clubs may present you with the 300. 
um, because it is it's just that little bit cheaper. It's it's almost the identical uh, ball to the 200. So those are the ones you'll see most of. Um, and so that's all that you really need um, uh, uh, to, to know from here. So the key document is the MBL um, uh, regulations. Um, so we'll move on to, to that and that document. Let's just go back to the top of it. Nick, before you yep. move on, I was on the FIVB website the other day, as one yep. does, and there's actually a new list of volleyballs up that was updated on the 1st of September. Yeah, oh, right, excellent. I shall get um I shall get it um so moved. might want revisiting because I've from memory. I think there was something else appeared, wasn't it? Just I can't remember. Right. So it's, listing, it's listing snowballs now as well. <laughs> Yes, yes, snow volley, the um, the attempt by the FIVB to appear at the Winter Olympic Games as well as the Summer Olympics. Yeah. Um, I can't remember where I found it. It wasn't obvious. And I, I, I came across it by accident. OK, I'll, I'll search it out. September 21. OK, it's, it's normally an addendum to competition regulations somewhere in there. But I'll, yeah. uh, I'll have a look for it and make sure that that list is checked to make sure that all of those balls are still legal. But the most most common balls, the Gala, the Molten uh, and the Macaza balls, um, you will see relatively frequently. OK, so MPL regulations. So um, the point of the MPL regulations is to um, is to support the FIVB rules of game. So if if it doesn't say it in the MBL regulations, then the FIVB rules of game apply. OK, that's how we use them. So so these are specific regulations for the management and the running of. Volleyball in uh, in England. And th they apply for the season starting 1st of September 2021 and they run through to the 31st of August 2022. Um, and if it's in the, this regulations um, as a specific comment, then it applies over the rules of game. But if it is not specific in the regulations, then the rules of game apply. That's how the, the regulations are used. Um, there will be different regulations for different competitions. So if you're at an interregional or an under 15 or an under 16 or under 18 competition, it's always best to look out to see if there are re regulations that apply specifically to that competition. Student Cup, for example, uh, Boosa, Bucks Championships, all will have um, their own small uh, changes to the regulations. And it's always best to check before you go to a game that you know the regulations for the match that you are um, going to officiate. Um, so um, the, the key elements of the, the regulations, and a lot of them are aimed at the teams and about how they are um, organized and um, how they register players and things like that. So um, whilst a lot of it is useful to know, a lot of it you don't actually have to know all of it because as you can see, there are a significant number of pages in this document, 47 odd, um, a lot of regulations there um, which um, apply to sort of like making sure that teams have the right number of players at the start of a season and things like that. So we're going to look at um, organization of fixtures, um, registration, a little bit of registration, but not too much, preparation for matches, an arrangement at matches. And then we're at the uh, the appendices. We want to look at the minimum operating standards and we will look at the um, protocol. So um, we may um, have to uh, flick around a little bit, but not too much. So we can flick past the administrative matters because that doesn't that all applies to clubs and how they're um, set up. Um, and then we have organization of fixtures. Um, and a lot of that, again, is um, for, for teams to say how how the, the, the matches are set up, etc. But there are some elements of it um, which uh, which as referees we need to to know. Um, and the first one of that is is regulation seven here which says where match referees are appointed by Volleyball England, the date, time and the, and the date, time and venue is changed. The original home team becomes responsible for notifying, notifying those referees and um, the MVL officials group member for the change 
um, or if those referees cannot do it, appointing new referees. So when you are in who's the ref, let's flick to who's the ref, here's who's the ref, um, on your landing page of appointments, you are given the date and the time of the match and um, the two teams, the home team and the away team, and what role you're going to have at the match. Now, the time that is on here is the time that uh, the warm up starts. So, this is not the match start time, this is the warm up. This is half an hour before the match start time. Now, I know that on the 29th, 6th of the 9th, because I received an email today, that that match for me is not going to start at 12 o'clock. It's going to start at 2.30. Um, so I'm the home team, Wessex Women 2, should be informing Volleyball England competitions and then uh, and by copy Martin that the time of this match has changed because it could be that either referee that's down for the match can only do it at 11 at the time that is was originally put forward for the game. If you can't do it at the revised time, then you have to decline the fixture. Um, uh, you don't have to, the team can't suddenly tell you that the time has changed by two or three hours and still expect you to be available if you've got other stuff on. Um, so um, in those instances, all you have to do is politely say, Look, I can't do the revised time um, and, I, and I, I have to decline the fixture. Um, so you can see here that the time has changed now. Um, under the MVL regulations, Wessex Women 2 should have already informed competitions that that had occurred. They've told the away team, um, but they haven't yet told Volleyball England. And the reason that it's important is that when you're on the Volleyball England website, back in here, um, there is a fixture list which is um, set up for um, the various competitions. Um, and I think this weekend it's National Cup. But as you can see, there's a fixture list here that says, you know, there is a match taking place between Leeds and Sheffield at a, at 11.30 at Ruth Gould's Academy on the 2nd of October. Now, if that match is moved to three o'clock in the afternoon, anybody that might want to be going to watch that match is going to turn up considerably before the match, or if the match has been brought earlier, could be turning up after the match is already finished. So if we're going to publish the start times, the teams have to make sure that the start times are correct on the website, and that's why they need to fulfill this um, regulation. And as referees, this is one for us to just make sure that you have checked that uh, you know that the match is going to start when you think it's going to start, because your who's the ref um, notification is what we know the start time to be when you get your match confirmation, which you should get up to 14 days prior to the match. Um, when you get that, you just need to double check. Is it at the place you think it's going to be? And is it at the time you think it's going to be? And if you mean, and if it's changed, and that means you can't do it, you are gonna have to say, sorry, I can't do this anymore. Um, and, and there'll be no comeback on you because it's the team that's changed the information, not you. OK. So uh, that's the uh, that's the key one why it's ne it's needed to uh, to to take uh, make these changes and make sure that people know about them. Um, when a match is cancelled at short notice, the home team is responsible for ensuring that the officials are aware. If as if as referees the match is cancelled after you have already travelled, then you are due your match fee and your travel expenses. So if you travel to a venue and suddenly find that the venue is closed for maybe they've had a, you know, something's happened that they can't put the game on, they didn't weren't able to tell you whilst you were on your way or anything like that, or before you started traveling, um, then the home team will still be responsible for paying you um, your match fees um, for your trouble. So let's uh, so th those are just a couple of things around the the, the, the start times and, and just making sure that you're aware of what's going on now. Registration of players. As referees, we are not responsible for um, determining whether a player is registered or not. If the home team, if the team, sorry, home or away, if the team says that the player is registered, 
And you can identify the player as they are who they say they are. So they have some form of um, hopefully uh, um, uh, photo ID. Then you allow them to play. It's not for referees to determine whether a player is registered or not registered. Now you can check. And that means that you will need to go to um, our old friend, the, the, the Board of England website. And when you go into the website, um, you should just be able to click on the team to find out um, who is responsible. So I've just clicked on Leeds Gorse Men um, there. And underneath, I can see that these are the current players who are registered for that team. So luckily they they've got um, they've still got a few days to get find another two players um otherwise their second of october match is going to be a bit on the short side um and, and won't be taking place but they at least have a coach and they have three players at the moment so when you go into the um website into the competitions into the National Bodybuilding, there are a number of ways of getting this information. You can either go through the league tables and just click on the team. So if you click on Mallory Eagles, you get taken to the, the team. And hopefully, again, Jefferson finds a couple of players before his first match. Um, so there's that way of doing it. Or you can go into the fixtures and, again, click on the team. And it will also take you straight to the list. Now, one thing to note here, you've got to be able to recognize the player from the photograph. OK. So Jack McKelvey or um, our team Sunderland here, um, this photograph is not <laughs> acceptable. Um, you cannot identify him from that photograph. So therefore, when Jack McKelvey turns up at the game, you are going to go to him. Jack, can I see some photographic ID, please? Simply because your photograph on the Volleyball England website means that we cannot identify you. And he needs to provide that. Otherwise, you'll be going, well, I don't know who you are. Um, and, you, and hopefully they will have sorted that out before we get there. Uh, before we get that far. The other thing that you get is you do get a lot of this. You get photographs which are taken off phones when they're out. Um, you might get players that are, have, have, have put a photograph of them at the at the local, um, at the, the last wedding they went to. So you might get them with a, with a top hat on or uh, so. So it's best to, you know, Brent Thompson here has given us a decent photograph that we can certainly know who Brent Thompson is. Um, Jody Amor as well, uh, Kieran Salden. Um, Jack McKelvey's photograph needs to improve. <laughs> if otherwise, whoever does um, their match, Team Sunderland's match, um, is going to, against Newcastle staffs is going to have a bit of a problem identifying the team. So that's two ways of identifying the players. Um, and you're just going to take the match um, report, match um, list, player list from the coach, which should list all of the players that are there. And you're just going to check that against um, it. Hopefully they've got a printout of the Volleyball England website with their photographs on, which makes it really easy for you to do. Or you may need to try and get the, the, the photographs up online at the time and just check them. OK. Now, registering one thing that you'll get at, at the beginning of the season, it's always a bit more um, uh, tricky at the beginning of the season is because players may be um, registered at really short notice. Um, so what, what you used to, we used to get a lot was, um, we used to get, uh, uh, this player is going to register on the day or the details are with Volleyball England. Um, details are with Volleyball England is not uh, an acceptable reason um, for not having um, a player's registration details. OK, so um, any player that um, doesn't have their registration detail, the registration on the website must have an email from Volleyball England saying that they are registered. And they would give you this plus their photographic identification um, to confirm their to confirm that they are registered. So in this instance, if a player turns up on the sheet and says they say uh, it's a it's a late registration, here's the players 
uh, photographic identification. As I said, you're not responsible for checking that they are registered. All you're responsible is, is to check that that player is who they say they are. And, and just to check their, their uh, identification against the player that's in front of you. And once you've done that, you have um, satisfied your responsibilities of, as a player for checking that the player that uh, is on the team sheet is the correct player. OK, whether they are registered or not is up to the club. That's the club's responsibility, it's not yours. Um, so um, I think that's uh, so just have a you don't need to look at all of the regulations here within within um, within this or in the ones that apply to the player because um, they are section uh, E, I think. Uh, yes, yeah, so all of this stuff about players and volley zone and national inter international transfers and whether they're playing up or not. Um, you you don't need to. Um, to it, it's worth knowing it so that if you get a query, you know where it is. Um, but generally um, you need to um, you don't need to, to, to be able to you, you're not going to enforce any of the stuff in here, um, including playing up rules or anything like that. Um, if you want to make a note on the score sheet, if you know a player is playing up from a from a lower ranked side into the senior side, um, you can you can you're quite welcome to do that. You know that juniors can play up without any restrictions. So if they're under 18, it doesn't um, it doesn't matter if they're playing up, um, they can do so. So you don't really need to, to worry too much about that. So. Um, the the next. Uh, element of the of the um, registration that uh, you need to know about really is the technical members of the team. So each team should arrive with a coach. OK, um, and they should be registered and you know that anybody who sits on the team bench must be registered as a coach, an assistant coach or bench personnel. Now, uh, a a coach can have more than one bench personnel for more than one team. But what they can't do is they can't be um, bench personnel for, say, Mallory Eagles, and then suddenly uh, turn up at London Docklands and say, oh, I'm bench personnel and present their Mallory Eagles bench personnel um, registration as the as to allow them to sit on the bench. They must be registered with each individual team. So they should turn up with a coach. Now, sometimes the teams don't turn up with a coach or they don't have a, a suitably qualified coach in the club. And therefore, they might have a coach, but the coach might not have the respective qualification that allows them to be classed as a coach. So in that instance, the team captain assumes the coach's responsibilities. Now, if you've got a player who says, Oh, I'm going to coach it today. I'm going to be coached today, um, but I don't have a coach's qualification. Um, and then you've got another player who says, well, I'm the team captain. The best thing for the team to do is to make the player that's going to be the coach, the team captain, before the toss and before the score sheet's completed, so that the player that wants to be coach can be coached because they're the team captain. Um, and you don't have any problems with, for example, the 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 the, the player that wants to be coach being on the bench, the team captain is on the court and the player that's on the bench wants to stand up and coach the team. And then a second referee, you're going to be constantly telling them that they cannot stand up. They've got to sit down because they can only be assistant coach or they can only be a, a player on the bench. They cannot coach the team from from the sideline and you get this confrontation. So try and deal with it early. So what happens at the, on the score sheet is that you wouldn't um, put the the coach's details in the coach's box. If there is no coach present and the coach's section will be left blank, then everyone knows that the team captain has assumed the coach's responsibilities. Their name doesn't need to appear in the coach's box unless, of course, they have a coach's qualification for that team. Um, don't uh, so so that means that uh, if, if somebody um, comes along with the team who just has a bench personnel registration but doesn't have a coach registration they cannot be the coach either so just by saying well i've got a, pe a bench personnel registration does not allow them to assume the coach's role 
So in that instance, you'll have to say, well, I'm sorry, you can sit on the bench because you have a bench personnel registration, um, but you are not allowed to stand up and coach the team. OK, um, just causes a little bit more for the second referee to watch what's going on and to make sure that they understand who can and cannot um, uh, fulfill the various roles. Um, and this is because, and the reason this is in the regulations is simply because um, if you if you allow the somebody with a bench personnel regulation to to coach the team, they will never get a coach's qualification because the team will go well if they can do it with a bench personnel reg registration. I'm never going. We're never going to put them forward for a coach's qualification, which is obviously to get to the right level is going to cost the club uh, about six hundred pounds uh, of coaches courses to get them to the required level. So that's why it's in there. Um, that's why 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 um, coaches have to be coaches um, in order to be a coach. As you'd hope. Um, so that kind of covers the technical the technical members of the team. Um, so if we look um, then at, uh, I think the next one to to look at would be to let's let's go to the minimum operating standards because um, they are the ones that you um, that you then have to to look at and they are in section M of the regulations. So let's whiz down to section M if we can find it. Um, or not, it's not M, it's N. So the various leagues, the various divisions, sorry have different operating standards. You would expect Super League to, to, to be able to um, uh, comply with all of them. And Division 3, there is a lot more um, leeway. So let's have a look at what we consider to be, excuse me, the, the minimum operating standards for a match. So if it is a Super League, uh, the team, there should be a team list. And that's the same for any division. There is no every team must have a team list, a written out team list, not a, you know, hopefully it's not something that's scribbled down. There are there is a pro forma on the Volleyball England website. It's pretty easy to download it and for the team to print it up and, and, and do what they need to do with it each each game. So it's not a difficult one. Uh, they must have um, uh, substitution equipment, so paddles and buzzer. So this is preferred or recommended in Division 3, but if they haven't got it, they haven't got it. Um, but in D Division 2 and higher, they must have paddles and a buzzer. The players um, kit. So in Division Super League to Division 2, then the shirts must be numbered correctly, 1 to 20, as per the FIVB rules of game. In Division 3, there is more leeway because if you've got a junior side, you may get some much higher numbers because the, the club may have lots of juniors. So therefore, that's why there is a bit of leeway there of one to ninety nine. But a team which has come from Division three and got promoted in Division two cannot use the. Oh, but um, we, 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 we haven't got our new kit yet. Or we haven't bought a new kit yet, and so we're using last year's numbering. No, no, because. You know, uh, the situation was and I, I can think back to a team that did that said that to me in Division two, uh, two seasons ago um, when I when I first saw them in uh, February. So they'd been using this excuse every single week since October as to why their kit was numbered higher than 20. And every referee went, oh, well, OK, I'll give you a bit of leeway. But we were in February by the time I saw them and they were still using the same reason for why they weren't in the correct kit. But they were in the minimum operating standards for their division was one to 20. So therefore, the kit that they were wearing was inadmissible. Now, in that situation, you wouldn't stop them playing, but you must make a comment on the score sheet. You must feed it back that this team is still using this this reasoning for not meeting the minimum operating standards. Shorts. Um, when it says um, yes in Super League and Division One, it means that they are all the same. That that doesn't mean that one player's in Nike, one player's in Adidas, one player's in Araya, uh, one player's got a white stripe down the side. Um, it means that they're all the same. 
it's a uniform and the reason it's called uniform is because they're uniform so the team must be correct and if they're not then you have to write it on the score sheet inform them before the start player is not correct you need to inform them in division two and division three similar okay so again you can have nike shorts and and area or, or adidas shorts as long as the color is the right color it doesn't matter that the make is different but in division super league and division one the make they should all be the same um socks this is one that you see within uh, in in the men's game not so much of a problem in the women's game it can be a problem socks mean socks um so players that say oh well i i, I don't wear socks or i i I wear these um, trainer socks that you can't see above the trainer. Um, so I'm wearing socks, but you can't see them and all of that sort of stuff. Um, in Super League and Division One, the socks have to be, they should theoretically be the same length for all players in the team. That's what it means by having a uniform and socks. They have to be the same color. So, um, now they could be they could be hidden underneath a, an ankle support or or a support, but they have to be be there. They can't just because a player says, "Well, I, I wear a full um, a full support from my foot right up to my knee," doesn't mean that they shouldn't be wearing. They have to be wearing socks. They can't they can't say, "Well, I, I can't wear a pair of socks with this support." Well, sorry, you need to be wearing socks. So th this is this is what it means by minimum operating standards. In um, divisions two and three, bit of leeway, you'll see all sorts. But again, they should not be different colours, but they can be different. Yeah. Um, line judges. Um, yes to uh, the first three divisions and recommended in division three if you're lucky. Um, uh, live streaming. Um, most of the Super League teams are organised and know that they can live stream and uh, have the scores added to the live stream. There's little widgets that can can do this stuff so they know what they should be doing. Um, in Division 1, they need to live stream it, but they don't have to get the scores on there. But we don't have to check that. Not one of our problems Follow England will be doing that. Uh, match programmes, Super League, yes. Other divisions, no. A match programme can just be two lists. Today we're playing Durham. Here's our team, here's Durham's. That's good enough for a match program. It could be one sheet of paper, it doesn't matter. As long as they've gone to some effort to try and give somebody who might turn up to watch some form of this is the match that's going on and, and this is what you'll see. Um, and match reports, um, yeah, recommended, um, but it's not something we have to, to um, worry about. Um, when we talk about um, paddles and buzzers, um, common sense here um paddles need to be numbered correctly so you know if you as we saw here um in division two um we're supposed to have shirts one to twenty and if our team that's come up from division three still wants to use their old kit it might be have numbers of 45 or 99 or whatever it is um because they've got to um because they've got to have paddles They've got to have paddles which are numbered the same as their shirts. So you need to make sure one of the checks you do before the start is that some teams have a, a box of paddles that they're not. You have to go through them and make sure all the numbers are there and that all the numbers you've got to your teams are there as well. Uh, buzzers, hopefully as second referee, you'll be able to hear it. Um, theoretically, the players might be able to hear it, but if you can hear it and they can't, you'll have to use your whistle to support it. But as long as they've got a buzzer, then um, then fine. If they've got an electronic whistle, then they've clearly got a buzzer that will work. That'd be loud enough. Um, so um, so when it talks about um, uh, the kit and the match programs, there's a bit more information about it there, um, and uh, and and the team lists, and and hopefully the team list will be there, and they'll identify on there who the captain is and who the liberos are. Uh, if you're unaware, then then just go and ask who who is going to be. Are you playing with the Libro today, coach? Before the scorer gets to write it all down and ends up having to cross out the Libro from the team list and put them into the Libro box. Um, you know the the general things that happen um, that uh, that you need to look out for. So so that is those are the minimum operating standards, um, and 
don't be afraid to 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 talk to the teams about them the same way as the FIVB rules of game are clear about things like compression. There is nothing to stop a player using compression, but they the compression must be white, black, or the same color as the nearest piece of kit. So most teams, if they've got any sense, will choose white or black, and all the players that need compression will have a black compression or a white compression, and there won't be um, day glow yellow and day glow orange or day glow pink just because one player wants to be different to all the others apart from the libro of course the libro can wear whatever color they like um because they could be different but it should match their uniform so if you see something which is not compliant then point it out to the team the very first game because it's no good um as i say it's no good me seeing a team for the first time in february and pointing out to them that they've got the wrong compression um, and they them saying to me, well, every other referee that I've seen this year has not mentioned it, so it must be OK. So first game, deal with it. There and then, is it correct or is it not? Um, and and uh, make sure the team understands. Same with things like numbering of shirts. You know, the, reg the rules of game are very clear about where the number has to be placed and how big it should be. Now, you can give a little on size because there could be advertising and all various other bits and pieces. Um, but make sure it's in the centre of the chest. And if it's not in the centre of the chest, you, then you, you say to the team, I'm sorry, but your numbering of your shirts is not compliant. And you have to put it on the score sheet. Uh, you have to feed it back. Yeah. Make sure the captain has a line under their number. Get them to put tape on it. Start out the season with the right standards and do it every match. And then the players will know. That, that, that there is a there is a level of standards which the referees will expect of them and and what they need to do okay so let, that's enough about uh, about that so let's let's just whiz down um some of the other things which uh, within the regulations which we need to to understand um as i say we're not going to cover all of them because most of them we don't actually have to to worry so one of the uh, one of the key one is preparations for matches um so um Arrive in good time, OK, um, uh, the, the team's responsible for making sure the whole time is the correct amount of time for the match that's being played. Um, we know from the rules of game what we're expecting in terms of facilities, uh, that the court doesn't prevent a, 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 an, an, an obstacle or a danger to any of the players. And if it does, ask the home team to sort it out make sure that uh, that everything is correct get there in plenty of time so this is when we talk about getting there at least 45 minutes before the start or an hour before the start i think an hour is a good time you've got half an hour to get changed and to make sure that you've checked everything in the hall so that you're comfortable that everything's okay to go um have a look around and just make sure you're you're confident about what's going on um It'd be nice to know that every every venue has a minimum temperature of 10 degrees, but you know, we'll hope we'll we'll live in hope. Let's um let's hope that most clubs probably think that, that says 10 degrees Fahrenheit um rather than centigrade, but we'll we'll um, we'll live in hope on that one. Um where it says sanction box, um the, the FIVB have moved away from having a sanctions box. There's no penalty chair anymore in international competition. It was considered unnecessary clutter. Um, so if you don't have one and you and you do have a, 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 an expulsion or disqualification, uh, an expulsion to deal with, then you just say to the player, go and sit on the end of the bench. Yeah, and, and just so you know where they are or go and ask them to go and sit in a chair or get a chair. They can go and get a chair and sit somewhere where they're away from everyone else. Um, as I say, check all of the uh, check all of the equipment to make sure that you're comfortable with what's going on. OK. Um, Second referees brief the scorer, make sure that the scorer knows what's going on, what, what's happening, and the fact that um, they're going to be responsible for for um, uh, various things. Um, there are no um, technical timeouts, okay, in the MVL this year. No technical timeouts. Doesn't mean to say that they might not come back, but there are no this year. Just uh, and we'll come to the COVID uh, addendum in a second. Because that also had, that has a change in it, um, so um, yeah. So just just do your do your checks, then do your playing kit checks. Okay, um, 
This is also the area where you can find out if you've forgotten how much your match fees are. Um, and remember that um, your um, that uh, travel is at 25 pence per mile. Um, and uh, Bolly Zone, uh, sorry, not Bolly Zone, who's the ref will tell you, actually tells you what the distance is in the, if you click into the match, it will tell you where the venue is and it will tell you from your home address how far it is. Um, and that's and that's the sort of distance that we're expecting if you need to um, uh, to, to tell the club how far it's going to be before the start. And most most teams will ask you before the match how much of your expense is going to be. So they've got the money or they can do the transfer or whatever. Um, that's the distance and they and the teams can see that as well. So um, so if the team, so if bodies, if the who's the ref says that uh, by the, the best route, it's 50 miles, but you want to go a different route that's 75 miles then it's 50 miles that, that the team will be expecting you to um to charge them um you can go by whatever route you like um but that's the the amount that um uh that, that you will be able to charge and then there's a bit about referees here d4 which you need to know um which um obviously all referees should be registered um and should not be um uh to not really be um, uh, linked to the team. So we, we tend to avoid clubs that we're associated with when we get appointed. Um, right, so let's just, I think that's um, covered quite a, bit of the, quite a bit of the regulations that we need to, to know. As I say, it's worthwhile you just reading through them. Any queries you've got with them, please um, raise them either with me or with um, Martin or with um, James Murphy, the competition's uh, lead. Um, it's worth knowing about um, schedules and scheduling of timing of matches, um, particularly in triangulars. Uh, teams are required to arrive at certain times, so they cannot, you, you know, you cannot use um, the time um, uh, as an excuse if they if they haven't read the right time. So, in a in a triangular, just remember that. Um, that the 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 team that's got to play the second match of a triangular that's not already there must have arrived no later than one hour after the first advertised match start time. So if the first match start time is 12.30, they've got to be there by half past one. Now if the first match is already finished by then, then 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 you can't you can't penalize them for not being able to start the warm-up when you want to start the warm-up. So they will be there at one at 1.30, but you could start the warm-up at 1.30 because that's the time they should be there. Now, if they are late, um, the regulation that you need to apply is E5. And you need to be clear about this, that any team failing to appear on court ready to play within 20 minutes of the published start time shall for forfeit the first set. So if they arrive, if they appear 18 minutes after the start time, ready to play, then they're ready to play. OK, so it says that they must be over 20 minutes late to forfeit the set. OK, so if they are more than 20 minutes late, then they forfeit the set 25 nil. Yeah. They can if they've lost, if they um, if they then um, do lose that set because they're too late for it, then they can have a warm up time, which is the 20 minutes that was available for um, the, the next it, interval, as long as the other team agrees. Now, they don't have to because um, they will have already warmed up for 30 minutes and they don't want to probably don't want to keep going for another goodness knows how long. Um, so the second set then commences 20 minutes after that. So that's 40 minutes after the start time. So this is these are the times that you have to have in your mind. If they appear within 20 minutes of the start time, there is no forfeit. If they appear after 20 minutes of the start time, they forfeit the first set, but they have got to be more than 40 minutes late to forfeit the second set. So it's, it's not a case of not being there when you want to start. It's being there at the, these times and be clear about, about them. Now, hopefully by this time, you know the reason why they're going to be late, if they're going to be this late. 
Um, and for example, if they then don't appear after until after a whole hour has gone from the start time, then the match is is, is forfeited completely. OK. Um, if you've got any doubt about this, as Martin says here, If the team arrives ready to play 19 minutes after the official start time, they are still entitled to play the first set, but they must forego the warm up. Yeah. So if they turn up at 19 minutes and they say, oh, yeah, well, we need five minutes to warm up, you're going to have to say to them, well, if you warm up for five minutes, you're going to forfeit the first set because you will be 24 minutes late, which is more than 20 minutes. And therefore, the team has to make a decision start or forfeit the first set at uh, their dish, their choice their choice the other team cannot influence you on this you must know the, just keep these times in there and refer to them so this is why i say about having a copy of this with you um if you uh, uh so that you can refer to it if you need to yeah because there's nothing wrong with trying to think about it and make it up don't make it up refer to the to the regulation get it out find it read it to them this is the this is the regulation, so this is this will this will help. OK, so that um, kind of is is. Um, late uh, uh, late arrivals. Um, I mentioned earlier. Um, the, right, OK, so just just very quickly. Um, if the team has two Libros, they don't have to be in the same shirt. OK, they could be in two different shirts as long as both shirts are a different dominant color to the color of the team. OK, it'd be it'd be nice if they were in the same color, but they don't have to be. Um, so um, so if they have two Libros, uh, as long as they you know, if the team's in blue and one Libro's in red and the other's in green, fine, easily identifiable. You don't have to worry as long as their number shirts are numbered correctly. Don't have to worry about it. OK. Um, when you fill it, when the um, uh, team sheet is filled out, there's no need to put the player registration numbers on the team on the on the score sheet. They're too long. So just leave them off. Yeah. If you've got two players who have the same initial, same surname and initial, you'll have to find another way of identifying. So if it's sort of like, say, it was um, uh, uh, Steve Smith and Simon Smith, then um, you would just have to put them Smith SI and Smith ST or something on the score sheet to make sure that you've identified which is which um, in case they, for example, get uh, sanctioned during the game. Obviously, their penalty points tally will need to identify exactly which player is which. Um, uh, it, when you get your um, uh, match confirmations just confirm them back to the uh, to the and say that you've received it all from the um, uh, from from the home team. All right. Um, and if you issue uh, an expulsion or a disqualification in a match, um, you must submit a report. An email will do. It doesn't have to be long. An email will do. Um, and that needs to go um, to um, competitions at volleyballengland.org. Uh, and Martin Shakespeare. Um, but co competitions.volleyballengland.org uh, is 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 uh, satisfactory. Or you can, you know, and, and that's just don't send it to too many people because um, some of them might have to sit on an appeals or disciplinary panel. And obviously, if they're included right at the start, then they can't be there for an appeal. So you don't 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 copy in every everyone. Just um, keep it relatively. Um, relatively narrow to um, to who it needs to go to. Um, and, and I think that's that's probably um, it on the um, the regulations. Um, as I say, read them through. They're, they're worthwhile having a read through. So the, what we were going to do next was we let's just have a look at these um, COVID addendum. Um, so what I would say is um, this is recommendations. You may find that different things happen at different venues and you can't assume that what happened at one venue will happen at another. OK, so let's just um, 
make it a little bit bigger. So the, the competitions uh, working group has said that these addendums override the regulations. OK, so the COVID addendum is the first, then it's the regulations, then it's the rules of game. So the, the COVID addendums um, say that, and, and, and we may as well just cover, cover them um, as we go through. So electronic whistles are the preferred option for referees. A handheld squeezy whistle, if you know how it works and it, you can get it loud enough, fine. Um, you may find that a lot of venues or a lot of teams will say, don't worry about that ref, just use your blown whistle. But if you arrive at a venue with just a blown whistle and the team or the venue says, no, you can only use a handheld whistle and you haven't got one, then you're not going to be able to referee the match unless you can borrow one from somebody there. So um, whilst um, just, and it might be worth, just contact the teams before you go and say, are there any restrictions? Are they, am I going to be, you know, what, what are you expecting of me when I get to this game? Um, so that you know you're forearmed and forewarned if there's any special stuff that the, the venue wants done or the home team wants done or the away team, for example. So, you know, some, some different teams will react in different ways. OK, so just be aware of that one. Um, personally, I have an electronic whistle and I'm going to give it a go. Um, but as I say, you might find that the teams will say, you know, I'm quite happy for you ref to use your whistle if you want to use your whistle. But best to check before you get there. Um, teams do not change ends unless the referee determines there is a need for it. Um, it's going to have to be a, a really good reason. So if you're at a venue that the sun always causes problems at one end, or there is a, a venue that has something that, that is really low from the ceiling that only affects one end of the court, you may have to change ends. But if there isn't that, there is no reason to change ends. OK, so not even in the fifth set. They stay as they are um, throughout the entire match. And as long as the captains know that at the toss, then they can make a decision as to whether they choose ends or service or reception. So if they're concerned about it, they'll choose ends over service reception. Yeah. Um, so uh, so just 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 check the venue when you get there. Look if there's any particular reason why the teams should change ends. If there isn't, they don't. It's a it'll be a lot easier. And and don't think and and then the score sheet. The trigrams go in the right sides, so the scorer just keeps the trigrams the same side. They can just cross out the A and B stuff if if um, they don't have to worry about A and B. But as long as the trigrams are right, so it's always going to be A B A B A B A B A B. If in, in that instance, there won't be any of this A B B A A B B A stuff. Okay. Um, the the teams can use a bench if they want to. Okay. Um, if they're not changing ends, fine. Um, if they are changing ends. Then there may be some further um, uh, things that have to be done because the venue requires them to do it. So they might have to wipe it down, for example, or they might have to take it with them. Um, similarly, with substitution paddles, um, if the teams are changing ends, they should take their own set with them. OK, uh, and swap them over. Um, if they're not changing ends, doesn't matter. But also as second referees, you're not responsible for putting all of the paddles back in the box. Yeah, whereas normally you'd go at the, at the change of set, so you'd go and do your tidying up routine, putting all the paddles back in, making sure you haven't lost any, that sort of thing, chasing the player that's taking it with them and getting it back and all that sort of stuff. Um, now, team's responsibility, okay? So if they lose one, they've lost one, okay? And you take the appropriate action when they turn up in the substitution zone without it. Um, you, you, and again, just just make it clear to them. This is this is the way it's going to be. You know, there there are some things that we used to do that we're not going to do anymore, uh, and this may be one of them. Um, uh, no post match hospitality unless the club really wants to do it. Um, line judges are required, so that, that's you still expect those. 
Uh, you don't expect to see a COVID officer, although one of the team may take responsibility for looking after the venue. Um, they, they're advised to have a risk assessment for COVID and obviously you will have your personal own personal risk assessment. So if you wish to, for example, wear a mask when you're talking to the players and the coaches, wear a mask. If you're up on the stand and you need to talk to a player and you want to put a mask on to do so, put a mask on to do so. That's entirely up to you. You have your own risk. You can understand your own risk um, and uh, therefore work within that. OK. Um, lineup sheets are required, although there are various ways you, you don't put, you know, there are ways that you don't have to touch them. If you don't want to, you could look at a coach's lineup sheet and jot it down on another separate piece of paper yourself if you wanted to. Um, there are some various apps that will take a photograph of a lineup sheet and turn it into a digital version for you to hold uh, if you've got that sort of thing. Um, or you could just um, say to the coach, um, I've seen the lineup sheet, I've seen you've signed it, I, I've checked it, it looks OK. Um, can you please put it on the scorer's table? And then they can put it on the table and the scorer can just look at it and write it down or whatever. OK. Um, so work within what you consider to be acceptable for that. OK, score sheets must be completed using your own pen. So when you come to sign it at the end and you're the second referee, you know, we've all got pens in our bags, hopefully. Um, so um, make sure that, the, you know, the captains will need to bring their own pen. The coach will need to bring his own pen. You'll have to have your pen. The second referee will have to have their pen and the scorer will have to have their pen. OK, so. But it's up to you. <laughs> you know, you can deal with that situation as you as you see with, and, and understand your own risk. So if you want to borrow a pen and then just wipe your hands or sanitize your hands afterwards, up to you. Um, spectators are determined by the host venue. OK, at 15 points and at the end of every set, match balls must be sanitized. So before the start, you normally get two match balls for the match and you've checked both of them. Sanitize both of them as soon as you can. And my advice is when you get to 15 points, swap one ball for the other. So just take the ball that's being played with. Kick it next to your bag or under the scorer's table or wherever it is you keep it during the match. So you know where it is and put the other ball into play. And at the end of that, then at the end of the set, then wipe both balls and then you're ready to go for the next set. OK. Um, players must also sanitize their hands. So at 15 points, they're going to nip off. This is not a timeout. This is the time it takes for them to squirt their hands, sanitize, get back on the court. And um, Rita asked a very good question last week about um, uh, whether um, about warming up and, and that sort of thing before the start. Um, my view is when the players arrive, they sanitize their hands. The balls that they're going to use to warm up with, they've um, sanitized, hopefully, or they haven't been used for three days or what, whatever it is that they've done. Um, and then both teams could agree that they will use the balls to, to warm up with. OK, when you start the match, the players would have sanitized their hands and therefore you just use the match ball. And at that point, in general, OK, there's going to be sweat and what have you, but you know, the, you, you are minimizing the risk and and also the known transference of um, uh, between off a sport piece of sporting equipment is very low. So um, it's very difficult to transfer from from one person to a piece of sporting equipment to another person. Yes, Rita. This addendum you're looking at says it's updated on the 16th of September. I've got a hard copy of one that I printed off on the 16th of September, which I had for the weekend at the sitting Grand Prix. And my version of M just says volleyballs must be sanitized at 15 points and at the end of every set. It doesn't mention the, the hands. Now, if Volleyball England are going to keep picking these things out <laughs> with the same dates or whatever, yeah. they've got to be telling us they're doing it. Because they, yeah, yeah. I was sitting here thinking, oh, I've got the latest one. I'm all right. I've used yeah. it last weekend. And I'm refereeing on Saturday, and I wouldn't have made the players sanitize their hands because I just looked at our 16th of September. That's the one I've got. And I'm just yeah. sitting here thinking we didn't sanitize the hands at the weekend. Very, very good spot, Rita. Very good spot. 
so it always always pays to um it does pay to actually just double check that the regulations won't change ever during the season they are fixed at the start of the season but the as i say this addendum clearly um has been amended okay so you might just need to double check it every every so often yeah but right. con conversely the players probably or the teams won't actually know it's changed either no this is true so yes. so whether they should be sending something out to everyone saying it's been updated and telling us what the update is yeah uh, I know the uh, update from the third to the sixteenth was the shaking hands bit. Yeah. And now they've stuck this sanitize the hands in it. Yes. Okay. I get that. Okay. Okay. Yes, John. Um, you make a very good point, or a very good point was made last week about sanitizing the the warm up balls, but there's nothing in this um, protocol which actually mentions that. So. Uh, are, are we as referees when we confirm fixtures saying and we're expecting in the in the confirmation which you're going to or a response to both teams are we saying that we expect both teams to provide sanitized warm-up balls well uh, well i suppose there's, there's two ways to look at it one one is the fact that it, it, it really really and truthfully it's between the two teams and as a referee we probably don't need to get that involved in that so i suppose what we could say is we could say, look, it's up to you two teams to agree what how you're going to deal with warm up balls. Don't make it a decision that the referee's got to take, because otherwise you're going to get a situation where a team's going, well, we don't want to use their warm up balls. We want to use our warm up balls. Um, so therefore, they get they they're going to have to have um, separate separate official warm ups at the net, so five minutes each, um, if the, if they want to do that. Or if they're happy to both use the each other's balls as they get hit over as, as as normally would happen, then the two teams have got to come to that 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 arrangement. I I just think it would be sensible for them if they if they said we're, we're happy to use each other's balls. We've sanitised all of them before the start. But if they decide something else, then the warm up just leave it to them on on the warm up. It's a good point but, you make. It's a it right. is a good point. But but. Who's going to cause the conversation? Um, well, I think that um, I probably would just speak to the two coaches at the start and say, have you agreed? So that there is no doubt, there are no doubts that when you come to say, right, OK, guys, um, over the net and suddenly one team goes, oh, well, I don't like this. Um, I don't want to do this. Um, now, obviously, the 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 team doesn't have to tell you they want separate warm ups over the net until the point at which the official warm up over the net starts. That's in the rules of game. But um, so they could they could make that decision there and then. Right, we want separate warm ups. Um, or you just assume that they've had that chat between themselves and they've come to an agreement that they're going to just share the balls. I don't know which way it would go. I suspect that most teams will just carry on as though and, and one won't probably won't even have thought about it perhaps mm. brian yeah. what do you think if a team races into a 15 nil lead and you then sanitize the ball the other team then storms back to 15 all do you sanitize the ball again uh no only once only the first only 15 yeah, okay yeah. but uh, so it's, it's the first to 15 so yeah if you do get that situation of 15 nil suddenly becomes 15 all you will have you will have swapped the ball at 15 you won't do it again until the end of the set okay thank you um so there there it says no technical timeouts apart from uh, as i say this sanitization of hands is not a timeout unless the team wants to call a timeout at that point which they might do um no pre-match or post-match handshakes so um the pre-match protocol is as per the um regulations so we know that we have to do a, a, a quick line up to um, before the start, but the teams won't shake hands at that. They do, it's just a case of well done. Here are the two teams that are playing to anybody that's there to watch, probably just a scorer. Um, and um, then it's off. Right. Let's get on with the official warm up uh, at the end of the match. My view is the two teams congregate somewhere near the uh, three meter line and they either wave or clap their hands or um, or to say thank you very much, guys, 
Um, as referees, you're not expecting them to wander over and shake your hand. It's just a case of thank you very much, players. Can you just um, uh, appreciate the fact that the other team was there uh, for you? And um, and that will suffice. Um, there's no need. Now, if they then decide that they want to go and um, see a, a friend and, and be all over them, that's, that's their personal um, uh, decision. But that's all we, we would need to see at that point at the end of the match is, guys, just stand there and just uh, and just uh, show appreciation. As long as they know that's what they've got to do, they will they will quite happily um, will do that. Um, so let's just go through the explanation, just to make sure that we've got all of that right. Yeah, so it's just that. Um, Fast blowing whistles are still permitted if it's if it's OK to do so. Um, the referee determines whether it's necessary to change ends, which is fine. Um, uh, if the teams do change ends, team benches might need to be sanitised by the departing team. OK, we just mentioned that, didn't we? I think. Um, uh, I think that goes. The home team is responsible for sanitising the match balls when the first team reaches 15 points. So you can tell them to do it during the game or they may have somebody who can do it, um, do it for you at that time. It doesn't matter. Um, yeah, so it says here about um, at 30 minutes before the match start using the protocol, both teams are required to line up on the three metre line of their three up to the line up on three meter line on their side of the court and wave at the opposition okay so instead of them being lateral parallel to the uh, side of the court they must line up on the three meter line facing each other okay and you would expect them to do that before and after the match so that makes it much clearer this is this is the start and uh, of the protocol uh, and that's when they do so okay um so that's the um the, the uh, addendum so, so there's nothing. So hopefully there's, you know, and I think that as you go through various matches, you will um, uh, you will get used to this. Um, uh, uh, Katerina, you've got your hand up. Yes. Hi, Nick. Uh, just a quick question. I, I might have missed this, but uh, did we talk about scorers and assistant scorers? Uh, we talked about score, score sheet, but I, I have missed on the assistant score. Is the assistant score going to sit with the scorer and do they know that they're not going to change for the duration of the game? Um, yeah, that's a yeah, that's a um, one that I really hadn't thought about because um, of um, you would expect if they have if they want a social distance or if they they are expecting to social distance, um, then they'll have to either be able to sit at different ends of the same table or have separate tables um, to 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 do it. But they shouldn't um, the, the score sheet should not be passed between them, for example, or the scoreboard. Or whatever there should just be one person should do it for the match and then it shouldn't be a case of um the, the case will be where you have the men's and women's double headers um and you know as well as i do that at times you get uh, maybe maybe three different scorers during a match and six different line judges and um all of those sorts of things um but you should dissuade the team from doing that you say to the score at the start you know, by starting the score sheet, you're com you're committing to being here for three sets to finish it. Um, five sets to finish it. Um, that that's pretty much what they're doing by sitting there and starting the score sheet. That's fine. I, I'm I, of course it's not our responsibility as such. I just wanted no, to know if, if, the if, teams if they, it, that's if they all. then said no, it's all right. I you know I'm going. We we are going to stop. As and you said, well as long as you know, I, all I've got to do is sign it. So I'm not going to put my hands on it. I'm just going to look at it and then I'm just going to use my pen to sign it. I'm not going to I'm not going to touch it. So if they want to do that, um, they can do it up to, you know, I think with this, a lot of it will. Um, the teams will know the teams will get into a routine or they will probably just completely forget all about COVID and just carry on as they always have done. I don't know which way it will be. I haven't done a match yet. So. Uh, John, you. Uh, did you have anything else or was that hand up from earlier? <laughs> uh, 
I think that's hand up from earlier. Sorry. Okay. All right. Um, uh, Rita and then I'll go to Steve. Um, one thing that's not very clear when we were first talking about returning to play last year when it never happened mm -hmm. social distancing it was made very clear to us that nobody wrote on that score sheet except the scorer and we were told not to sign it and anything else now this covid it infers that we can be signing it but we've never ever been told that the original instructions of returning to play have been superseded by these instructions I don't know whether that's because I was actually talking to someone yesterday. He said, Well, we're not allowed to write on the score sheet. I said, We can sign it now. Well, so well, we certainly did at the weekend anyway. Yeah. I'm assuming that is the case. Um, yeah, we can. So we, um, we, we can sign the score sheet. If you, if you feel, as I said to you, about your personal risk, if you don't want to, then don't. My, that's, that's, you know. If 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 your personal views, I'm I'm happy to go to volleyball. I'm happy to referee the match. I'm happy to be there and to do that. But I won't put myself at any greater risk than I absolutely necessarily have to. Then um, and, and and that means not signing the score sheet because you don't want to touch it and you don't want to to, to go to to go to have that risk. Then then um, my view is don't sign it. Yeah. No, that, that's not the point I'm making. I mean, I'm quite, I was quite happy to sign the weekend. What I'm saying is some people have got the impression that because those other instructions were issued, that they are still in force. Because uh, okay. nobody's ever said they're not in force. Right. Um, the, I, I think these these instructions override what um, Body Brigland has previously um, issued regarding playing yeah. under COVID. Okay. Steve. Ah oh, yes. When we get to the um, the fifteen points sanitation break, um, coaches are inevitably going to start uh, giving coaching advice while people are sanitising their hands. Yep. Um, how how do you how are we to control that from just stretching on as long as the coach or the team feels like stretching it out by kind of you know just uh, sanitising their hands very slowly. Yeah, um, it's, it's going to be a tricky one to do. Um, I suppose all you need to do is to is to just be um, active and just tell them, you know, come on, this is only for you to sanitise your hands. You need to get back onto the court as soon as you can. Um, and and if they are if they take a long time, just uh, inform them that coach, if you don't get back on the court, I'm going to give you a delay warning for for stopping the match. Um, and just uh, and, and I suppose all you can do is just to remind them at 15 points, you have to sanitize your hands by the by the uh, regulations for the for the competition. Um, it is a sanitization break. Only the time taken to sanitize your hands is all that's required. And um, I would expect one player with a, with a bottle of sanitizer to stand on the sideline and square each of the six players hands for them to then rub it in and back to their positions and that is as long as it's going to take i do not expect them to go off look for bottles pick up water bottles or anything like that because that is delaying the game um and and i would treat it as such uh that's my my personal way i would deal with it i would talk to them before the start just make sure the captains know captains at 15 points we'll change the ball and you have to sanitize your hands i all expect you to do is this one one person to square each of your six hands and you get straight on with the game and and that's all i will be expecting and i'll just tell them at the toss this is this is how it's going to be um and and therefore you you limit the opportunity for them to to do other stuff i do admit it is going to happen steve and and you're going to have to just when it happens you're going to have to try and deal with it as best you can okay Sorry, that's a, a sorry. That's all I can sort of offer as a um, uh, as an answer to that. <laughs> we'll have to wait and see. Let's you know. Let let me know how it goes. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you how mine goes on um, on Sunday when I when I get to that one. Okay, uh, John, did you have a comeback on that now, or are you still hand up from earlier? 
still hand up from earlier because <laughs> That's I don't right. know how to cancel it. Um, oh, do I just oh lower hand right? I've got uh, it. Yes. Okay. Right. No problem. No problem. Okay. Um, so that's the um, uh, that's the the, the COVID uh, addendum um, for that. So um, I think if I go back to um, looking at where I was, um, can I ask one more question related to the COVID side? If that's okay, you can. Um, couple, well, two sub questions within that. One is, what about players touching other equipment, such as antenna or a stand, a referee stand itself? Um, is that does it have to be? I mean, how pedantic are we getting into this, or or not really? Um, I, I wouldn't stop. I wouldn't stop the match to wipe it down. Um, but but uh, you might ask the home team just to you know. Uh, I've seen during that set, um, the, the 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 padding was um, the padding was was touched. Or they could you just wipe it during, at the half time with you know? Hopefully they've got wipes. Can you just wipe that down that was touched during the game or whatever? Um, just see how it goes. I'm not sure how much, um, how many, how many times to play. I know they touch the posts quite a bit. The, if they got padding around them, um, uh, it's curious more than anything. And the second question is, I have what's happening with mopping any sweaty area, uh, because obviously you're going to get men's division, which are which are going to be, you know, pouring down with sweat, and then what, you know, obviously we don't want to have tissues or anything lying around. Who no. can clean that up, etc. So the team's responsible for. And there are, you know, the players are responsible for their own mopping, aren't they? Yes, just, we're, just not, we're, we're not expect, we're not expecting the home team to provide anything. Yeah. Um, if if the team wants the floor mop, then they're going to have to carry their own towel. Okay, so we can allow the player to go back to the bench, get their own towel, come back on court, wipe it, and put it back out. Um, well, I know the, I, I'm asking this because you know it's going to yeah. happen. Yes, I, I know um, internationally they would, should be carrying the towel if they're that concerned about it. Um, that's what happened in the VNL. The players had their own little towel uh, okay. because there were no moppers. There are no moppers. Um, yeah. So they, if they wanted the floor done, then they would uh, they would have a, you know, if it was too too big that somebody would on their bench would have the responsibility to come on with gloves on and, and do it. Um, all the players can carry their own towel. Thank you. Uh, yeah, they're, they're, they're going to have to work that out for themselves. But again, what you've got to, the, the difficulty for the referees is you've got to decide the difference between how long it takes to do it and when the team is taking far too long because they want a break. And that's the, always been the art of dealing with mopping. Even, even when we didn't have COVID, we always had to work out whether a team was mopping slowly or whether they were mopping as you'd expect them to mop to clean something up and get on with the game. And you'd know when a player was going, oh, doing it really, really slowly. Right, OK, delay. Get on with it. You know, uh, and, and you've always had that problem to work out whether it's delaying or whether or whether it's real. Um, and and you've also had the same issue internationally, I'm sure, about um, uh, of trying to deal with it when you've when you've actually got a kid out there trying to do it, and the team's pointing them all over the floor just to slow them down and get in their way and things like that. You've had to deal with that as well. So it, it works both ways. It's it's just one we're going to have to watch. But you know, don't don't try and let them take the mickey. Thank you. My view, if you can get away with it. Steve, did you have a comment on that one? Sorry, is my hand still up? It is. <laughs> um, it, it shouldn't be. I do uh, have a question, okay. actually. Go on, then. It should be um, up. Uh, well, we're not restricting um, shouting and chanting and things like that in any way. No, but um, clearly anybody standing at the net shouting at the opposition, <laughs> you deal with um, in the same way as you would um, any other form of um, through the net stuff. But in this instance, if somebody is relatively close to someone and they shout at them, then you, you, you're going to have to you're going to have to deal with it. Yeah, no, so, I'm thinking more in uh, in terms of um, some teams have their, their little cheers that they like to do. Um, yeah, yeah they, they, they can do that, can they? They, they can do that because in, in most cases they're only they're only facing each other. Um, but they, they will have they will surely have worked out their own risk. 
um, in that and decided whether they still want to do that, if they still want to touch hands and huddle and all of this sort of stuff. Um, hopefully we'll see less of it and therefore we'll have less delays to the game. But, you know, I, I live in hope um, that, that that might be the case. But we shall see. I don't know. It wouldn't have. It doesn't happen in sitting volleyball, does it, uh, Rita? So you wouldn't have been able to use last week's experience to uh, tell us whether that happened or not. They all cheered. They had their team huddles at the end. Yep. Yeah. There was no. Okay. There was, wasn't really an issue. They all lined up on the three metre line at the end and politely applauded. The yeah. referees walked down this tunnel of applause to get back. Oh, okay. They were hugging all the time, you know. Uh. It, it basically was business as normal, but at the end of each set, or no, at the end of the match, they had to actually mop the floor themselves with sanitizer. Okay. Yeah. Because they're sitting on it. And, yes. and, and the net as well. Yes. But of they did, each team did its own thing. All right. Okay. Um, right. So we're, um, we're relatively close to the end now. I just wanted to mention um, grade four courses. Um, Whilst, whilst I have you here. So um, you, you, the old model for a grade four course was that um, you had to find a venue. Um, you had to get four hours of, of, of court time. Then you had to go and um, find, a, find a, a classroom that you could spend the other four hours in. Um, and getting a course on was, was, was uh, quite an undertaking. Um, we've had a long chat about this as to whether the grade four course um, needs to have a practical element to it or not. Uh, as, as essentially it's a theoretical um, understanding of the game and that the um, upgrade from four to three R is technically the, the bit where you say to a referee that they are competent to uh, manage a game and can um, look after a match. So on that basis, what we've um, uh, thought uh, view for grade four courses, given that there is some pent up demand for refereeing, um, in that, and also um, we have a significant shortfall in certain areas of getting referees um, to um, help. For example, in the uh, in the northeast, uh, where helpfully in in Super League, um, we have um, Northumbria, Sunderland, New, Newcastle, somebody else up there. I can't remember what the other teams other teams are. There's about four teams there, and then there are two teams in Leeds and Sheffield. So in that sort of area of uh, of the country, we're 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 struggling. So um, with um, with this in this in mind, and knowing that there are um, lots of areas where that, that want to fulfil their ref, fill their referee quotas up again, um, we're going to look uh, to deliver them online wherever possible. Um, the courses would be scheduled as a as a date, and because they're online and they can be national. Um, we don't have to have a venue and therefore they don't have to be regional. And therefore, hopefully the courses can be scheduled a time and a date and they will take place on that time and that date. Um, because because it's just easy to do it. Um, the tutors will continue to be assigned by Seb Bidlart to to the courses, but we would come up with a, a plan and, and ask people beforehand whether they wanted to tutor the course and whether they were happy to do so. Uh, hopefully the course materials, um, I what you're going to talk through, will be available by the beginning of October. I've still got a little bit of work to do on those. But um, basically um, what we would do is once the candidates are signed up to the course, we would give them the VEOA to pre-plan for the course and to look at the rules of game. Um, then they would spend three evenings in one week covering the technical rules, um, maybe uh, two hours each session, and then one evening covering scoring and any questions. And then the exam will be through the BEOA. Um, and then the um, successful pass leads to grade four qualification, which is, as I say, effectively a theoretical qualification anyway. Um, so that's how we would kind of do grade four courses going forwards. Um, and we would expect to uh, start running them in um, possibly by the second week of October, we will have uh, a course up and running. Um, on that basis, we've already done a pilot in London, which worked OK. Um, and then we would um, uh, we would then uh, try and work out, uh, work a way of of, um, of getting the um, the candidates um, looked at, whether that's a training session that they can just do a scrimmage match or a local league or whatever it is that to, to make sure to get them from four to three hours as soon as we can and encourage them into the um, the National League if we can. 
Um, so that's what, how we're sort of planning on moving forward with grade, grade four courses. So I know some of you are in areas where there are very few referees at the moment in the National League. Um, and we've got some other ideas on how we might encourage uh, referees into the National League, but more of those when I know a bit more about what we can do. Um, the next thing is upgrades, and there were some beach upgrades during the season that's just finished. So um, whilst I realise that we got through about um, 70 percent of a season back in 2019-20 um, and um, we did deal with some upgrades during that time um, if there is any um, there aren't any significant upgrades that we've got um, going back that far um, what we're going to do is we will look at anyone who believes that they should be uh, moved up a grade um, to to uh, contact um, uh, contact us so that we can get a senior referee to a match with you um, to um, to then assess you and to uh, work out um, anything that you put maybe still need to do to get to the to the standard or or whether you're already there um, and then we would uh, we would look to upgrade through the season so um, I realize that the first um, the first couple of months maybe up to Christmas um, we're all going to be starting learning, getting back into refereeing. Um, I certainly know that uh, it's not going to be, I'm, I'm not going to turn up at, um, at uh, Wessex Women on, on Sunday and be the same referee that I, that I was uh, 18 months ago because I have not refereed a match for 18 months. So I know that this first few matches I'm going to start, there, there are going to be things that uh, aren't quite right and it's going to take a little while to get back to the, the previous standards. So we'll 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 look at the time up to um, uh, up up to Christmas, um, and then and then we can start upgrading from that. But there are some upgrades which come from the beach, um, and those upgrades are congratulations to these referees. So Katie Hooten is graded from grade two to grade one. Well done, Katie. Uh, Fiona Brock is also upgraded from grade two to grade one. Uh, well done, Fiona. Uh, Herman, well done. Congratulations. Upgraded from grade three to grade two on the beach. Thank you. Uh, Haina Azate is upgraded from grade three to grade two on the beach. And Daniel um, is, and I apologise, um, I'm not entirely certain how you say your surname, Daniel, so I, I, will, I will just leave it at Daniel for, for the moment and please accept my apologies for that. Um, you have been assigned a grade one beach um, uh, referee as Daniel is a Spanish referee um, and previously had an overseas grade. Um, and then in volleyball, there is one um, uh, upgrade to make you aware of, and that is that Lenny Barry has been um, upgraded from grade one to grade one national. Um, congratulations, Lenny for doing that. And that leads me on to saying that the grade one national referees so that you know who they are. Um, and these are the referees that, that can observe and can authorize upgrades and various um, other things. So these are the ones to look out for. Those referees are myself, um, Sebastian, Dominic, Katerina. Um, Christian Genetrini is no longer refereeing in the UK. So Christian is coming off this list. Um, and Joe Gore as international referees. They are also national referees. Um, then we have Brendan Fogarty and Peter Parsons, Deborah Smart, Diane Hollows, Martin Shakespeare, Ludo Kowaleski, Dee Walkup, Richard Burbage, and now Lenny Barry. So they are the, the group of national referees um, that are assigned for the forthcoming season. Um, and, con and congratulations to all of those. So um, I think that covers pretty much everything. The only other thing, oh, I was going to talk about VOA very quickly. So um, I need, I, the VOA is part of your Volleyball England um, registration. Um, and I can find it, here it is. Let me just log in. So um, the Volleyball England Officials Academy um, is part of it. You get you get a, a access to this with your registration. So um, what you need to do if you haven't already um, uh, signed up for it is um, you will come to the the login screen where I was before, and underneath, if I can go, let me go back to that um, because that's the easiest way to show you uh, what what you would do if you haven't signed up to it. Uh, you already signed in. Great. Sign now. 
Right, OK, I'm here. So down here, there's a sign up button. Down here, you would click the sign up button and enter your details. Uh, use the um, email address that you registered with Volleyball England on, because that's the one I'll use to uh, pre-authorise your um, uh, access. Um, you set your password up and put the details in, and then it will then send you an authorization email from membership at the Rules R. And all you need to do is to click on the authorization button within that email, and then you can get into it. So what do you find when you get there? Um, you effectively have a set of quizzes. So you have Volleyball Quick Learn, Sitting Volleyball Quick Learn, um, the NVL Regulations module, uh, Beach Volleyball Quick Learn, and uh, before the season starts, I will also open up uh, the grade four course exam um, quiz to you, which I'd hope you all have a go at, um, just to see that you, you are all still competent enough to pass the grade four um, exam, which um, uh, I, I'm sure you all are, but, um, you know, uh, challenge yourselves um, on this one. And what effectively the quick learn is, if you haven't seen this before, um, is that um, it's a set of questions. Uh, and um, so uh, there are about um, nearly 200 questions in the data bank at the moment. So hopefully you shouldn't be seeing the same question too often. Um, sometimes you see it in different orders, not in true or false questions, but some of them are multiple choice. So uh, a Libro is allowed to complete an attack hit on a ball entirely higher than the top of the net. So true or false, guys? False. False. OK, so what you can do when you're when you're in it, um, is when you click on next, it will tell you that your this is your answer. It's correct. And at the top here, you see the question has been replaced by the rule. So the question goes and, and if you think, oh, well, hang on a minute. What was the let me just read the question again. You can click the show question box up here and the Libro is allowed to complete an attack hit entirely higher than the top of the net. Correct. He is restricted and here's the rule. So if you if you answer a question and it says that you're incorrect, then you can just check your understanding by looking at the rule again, the question again and flicking to the to the rule that, that gives you the um, uh, gives you the answer. Um, and there are some various things in here um, when you get a multiple choice one here. So the, the height of the, net of the uh, women is measured at its center. Um, so um, you, you might have to scroll down on one or two of them, but hopefully not too many of them. Um, and there are 10 in the um, 10 in the quiz. Um, you can come out of it at any time um, and it just um, uh, it just allows you to uh, to go into. Um, it just says, do you want to you started a quiz? Do you want to keep going? Nick, uh, yeah, has have uh, these questions been updated, for instance, about a liberal being able to be captain? Uh, so. Right, very good point, um, Herman. So you are all aware the new set of FIVB rules that are going to come into force on the 1st of January do not apply to the MVL during the 21-22 season. So all of the new rules which are coming in in international volleyball do not apply to our MVL. We still use the existing set of rules, the, the 2017-20 to 20, uh, set, which are currently on the FIVB website, um, they are the ones that we will use for this season. So when you hear about changes to rules like the Libro can now be capped in and um, a team cannot be incomplete from an expulsion and um, uh, uh, the positional faults rule has changed slightly and, and things like that, um, those rules will be fully adopted for next season, not this season. And that was not a decision of the officials working group. That was a decision of the competitions working group. Um, from my perspective, I would have adopted the new set of rules as from the first match of the season. And we'd be playing with them because I don't think they uh, they detract from the game. But um, but the competitions working group thought there was too much going on at the moment to adopt a new set of rules as well. So they decided that we would continue with our existing rules. So no changes. Very good point, Herman. Thank you very much for reminding me on that one. And these these questions will be updated once uh, we start using those rules. OK. Um, and I will also with the MBL regulations module, I will start adding in some of the COVID addendum questions in there as well. Um, to do. There's only a few questions in the MVL regulations module, so um, I'm trying to build that one out when I've got a bit of time to add a few more questions in. And I know that some of you have co contributed questions 
Um, so I thank you for that, and I will get all of this updated as uh, as soon as I can. OK, um, Sarah. We've been waiting patiently. Um, it's just to ask, who do we contact about um, grades? Because I was observed in February 2020, but it's still overseas on my um, when I redid my um, registration. OK, um, can you just drop me in? Are you able to drop me an email with the with the details and I will follow it up immediately? Yes, yeah, so what's your email address? So I'm Nick dot yeah. Heckford. Yeah at bt internet yeah dot com okay thank you okay and rita two things firstly on the grade four courses i was due to deliver two grade four courses the weekend of the first lockdown yeah one of which was inside one of her majesty's establishments where there yes. were no matches but yeah. they did not have internet access we were doing it the old-fashioned way yeah so and we paper copies of rules and i'd agreed to mark exam yes. papers is that still going to be an option uh it, it's going to have to be for those environments absolutely yeah because yeah. i remember not... i was actually talking to one of the ptis at the civil service championships and he said yeah. oh you're supposed to be coming in can it still go ahead i said we can discuss it yeah yeah <laughs> so the conversation happened in 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 those in those in those scenarios we would still have to do a face-to-face -face course yeah, okay. i think there, there's the, yeah. the second thing was this weekend is a cup weekend yes i can't see anywhere any specific rules for the cup and especially concerning the players that take place but whether they have to register anywhere okay this i is... know last season i ran into a problem because there was one club that had two teams in the MVL, yep. but chose to put just one team in the actual competition itself. So when it came to where's where's the registrations that were coming across both teams, and I thought, like, oh, so do so I treat this as a Division One team or the Division Two team, yep. or what? And obviously we've now got non-league teams playing. So do their players have to be registered anywhere? Uh, yes, they do. Um, they needed they needed to have registered their teams on Volley Zone. Um, I think it was by the time their second the second match was took place. I, I just saw an email of it the other day. So yeah. um, Glyn raised this point. Um, a referee to cut match yesterday with two non MBL teams. Um, one team had their old league registration cards from London League. The other team had no registration cards. Yeah, basically, what I'm asking is where do um, I find the registration cards for this match on Saturday? You know, normally, you can't just rely on the MVL list because it might, they might be playing non-MVL players in that cup team. Yes. So so the so non-MVL teams must be, um, they must register their players on Volley Zone. Um, and therefore, they should have a list of uh, registered players. Uh, James Murphy, who's the competition's lead, said um, some teams have had problems with Volley Zone. Um, he agreed that for that round only, the first round, uh, they could send their player list of Volleyball England competitions as an alternative. Um, as I would have hoped, referees should only worry about that players are who they say they are. So if you have a list of names, then all you need to do is then say, right, OK, all I need is some evidence that, you, that, that this player is this person. Um, as you would do with any player that turns up, which you can't don't have a registration card for. OK, but if it's if it's a club that plays MVL and local league, do we have to assume that if they have an MVL team, it's only those players going to be able to play in the cup? Uh, That's what I'm no. saying, because we don't see the rules. We can't see whether they're allowed to play other players. Yeah, so so if they if if they are they are allowed to play other players, but they, that other player must still be registered so, to play in the competition. Yeah, but if they've got these two matches, where do we see that list for the team? Um, the team the team will have to provide it. To you. So we can't check it on the BE website anyway. Is what I'm getting at. Um, as far as I'm aware, no. But I will ask James the question. Okay. Um, and I. I come back to the, to the to my view on this, and that is that if the team presents you with a list of players, and and you can verify those players, 
it is not up to you to work out whether they are registered for that competition or not. All you need to do is to be able to say that the players that are on the court in front of you are the ones that they say are there. Um, and if they are not registered, that is the team's jeopardy uh, in this. Um, and therefore, all you're doing is saying um, the players that are listed on the score sheet are the players that were presented in front of me. And I agreed that they are the players that played the match. And then if one of those players is not registered, then that is up to Volleyball England and um, competitions to identify, not for us as referees to identify. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Sarah. Sorry, I think I forgot to put my hand down. That's quite all right. No problem. Um, OK, so. Um, uh, as I said, um, yeah, so so I was just uh, so um, what I would, if you find that you um, if you want to get onto VOA and you haven't before um, and you want to, to do that, can you give me um, a few days to get the new list of uh, registered users into the VOA? Um, so and I will um, try and get a. Um, uh, I will ask Volleyball England to send an email out to all the registered referees to let you know that that has been done. Um, and, and I'll do that um, by the. Where are we now Wednesday? Let's uh, I'll do that by the end of the weekend. Please use the VOA if you can. Um, you know, it's part of your registration. It does help. It, it's one of these things that can be used on a, a mobile phone, on a tablet, whatever. Um, uh, if you've got five, five seconds sat on a bus, sat on a train, uh, in your coffee break, whatever it is, and you can just click on the um, click, click on a quiz and just run a rules quiz and just see how you're getting on. Um, Nobody's interested in whether you get all the questions right or not, but over time, obviously, you'll get to know the answers to the questions and therefore, hopefully, your general uh, understanding of the rules will um, improve. And if anybody wants to help me write questions, I'm more than welcome to accept questions from anyone. And I know Tim Hebben has, has written loads, so um, uh, and I need to, to get that sorted. So, um, yeah, so, so if you want to write me a question or, or you read a question and you go, Nick, this doesn't make sense. Um, Send me a screenshot or or the or, we, or tell me what the question roughly says. I'll find it. I'll read it and work out whether it's the correct answer or not. Uh, hopefully they're all um, OK. Um, I've, I, I've, I've done most of the I've done done the quizzes a few times, so I, I think I've got most of the uh, gremlins out of the system. Um, but the aim is that how does this develop? Well, there are two things you'll notice here that it says challenges. Um, you uh, we will. Um, we will uh, start um, doing some uh, some things where we'll add a challenge in, um, whereby you can stick the an email address of uh, of another referee and say, look, I've just done this quiz. You have a go. See how you got on with the questions that I answered. Um, there are multiple choice questions. We can put diagrams into it, um, and we can also put video into it. And that's the most exciting part of it is to um, is to start getting some videos that we can put in and ask questions about the videos. So hopefully you'll be able to um, start seeing within the quick learn some some video questions popping up as we go through the uh, through the winter. Um, and that's how I think this will develop and it'll be quite um, quite a good um, a good thing to get to, to use. So um, yeah, just dip into it when you can. Uh, so I'll just put that's my plug for the VOA done. Um, as I say, um, I don't think I have anything else to uh, to say, um, apart from it's great to see you all, um, as always, um, it's it's a real pleasure to see my colleagues, and I hope that I will see some of you as we go through the season. Um, and um, and thank you for your uh, your time, as always. Um, Rita, have you got one final? Yeah, it's an theory? observation more than anything. Else. One thing that did come out at the sitting Grand Prix was the um the, the third set or the fifth set, as it were because the scorers automatically started left and right as they did. And of course, they then had a problem. So what I would recommend people say to the scorers, if you've established you're not going to change ends, is tell them to start using the two right hand boxes. So oh, you've, got yes. one, you've got the one to 15s. OK, Cause, yeah. Because they started off with the two left hand ones because they didn't change in when they got to eight. It's a bit of a mess then. <laughs> oh, I see. OK. They were having to but, write the extra numbers in. So if you use yeah. the two right hand boxes, you've got the whole set. Uh, yes, either either way, I'm sure. Um, yeah. Yes. OK, that's a good, good good point. Yeah, I'm sure we can um, work that out. I'm sure there's bound to be a five set match over the weekend. Somebody will work that out and see how, how they deal with it. So um, 
let's hope it's not at Wessex Women. Um, and <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, it, that that's guaranteed. I've got five sets on Sunday afternoon now. Um, so, uh, so as I say, th so thank you very much uh, for your time. Um, we'll get this up on the um, uh, website as soon as we can. Um, uh, I'll give it to um, Charlotte Lingham, our new communications assistant at Volleyball England, um, tomorrow if I can um, work out all the mechanics of it um, and get the recording for her. Um, and then uh, you can dip in. If you, any of you have any queries uh, about anything of the regulations um, on any match, then as soon as you have the query, if, if you're courtside and you can't find it or anything like that, um, you can either phone Martin Shakespeare, he'll know it probably off the top of his head. Um, James Murphy, you can phone the uh, um, uh, myself, um, as long as I'm not, if I'm refereeing, then you obviously won't get me, but if you can you can use those routes um, as soon as you can. Um, or, um, or one of any of the uh, referee observers or tutors um, or a senior referee that you know, just if you've got any doubts, stop. Try and find the regulation. If you can't find the regulation, try and ask the question. Um, but uh, don't, don't try not to make it up. It'd be my advice. Um, and um, enjoy the season. Enjoy volleyball. It's great to be back on the court. Can't wait really to, to get back out there. Um, and um, yeah, if you've got any questions, just drop me a line. No problem at all. And uh, I hope you all have a wonderful season. Same with Thanks. you, Nick. Have, enjoy your five cent match. <laughs> Thanks, Herb. Thank Thanks very much, Nick. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, Nick. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye, everyone.